Um, well, thank you again so much for coming, and I'm so excited to invite our BRAC speaker for today, Dr. Patricia Riesek. Dr. Patricia Riesek is a professor at Duke University. She is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Prior to moving to Duke, she was the director of the Women's Health Sciences Division at the National Center for PTSD, just down the road in Boston, VA. Um, to say that Dr. Riesek has made a contribution to the field of psychology and mental health treatment and research is an understatement of the year. Um, Dr. Riesek has been um, very, very involved in the treatment and understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and she is credited with developing, evaluating, and disseminating cognitive processing therapy, or CPT, which is one of the best treatments we have for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. It is used internationally, it has been translated to seven languages. Um, to put it bluntly, it just works. But as good scientists, you should know that you shouldn't just take someone's word for it that it works. And that is why Dr. Riesek is here to share with us some of the evidence as to why CPT is such an effective treatment. So please uh, bring your hands together to welcome Dr. Patricia Riesek. Am I blocking your view if I stand here? I hate standing behind podium. Uh, podia? <laughs> whatever. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I don't just want to show that CPT works. I want to show that uh, one of the things I want to show that things don't just come out in whole cloth and then they just stay static for years, which is why I called it the evolution. I'm not the only person who's been involved in the development of CPT. I started it, but it's come a long way. and We've changed it over time. We've learned things about it, dropped things, added things, modified things. So I'm going to walk you through some of that um, so that you kind of see that it, it you know, we have, to, we have to go with the times, um, and we have to go with the population that we're working with, um, and so forth. Um, I think there are chairs if you want to sit. <laughs> There's some over there. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about early CPT um, and revisions uh, that we made when we started to roll it out in the VA. Uh, I was actually in academia in a department of psychology, first in the University of North De or, or South, uh, South Dakota, the, the, um, and then um, I was in tw for 23 years at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and that is where I actually developed CPT. Um, and then moved to the VA, and someone else actually did the research to find out that it worked with veterans, and then the VA decided to roll it out, and it was the first of many rollouts, um, meaning dissemination projects. And what we learned um, over the, that interim period between the time I developed it, researched it, and we started to roll it out is if you build it, they don't necessarily come. You really, really have to get people to try, try to do something um, and try something new um, and take the time to learn it. Uh, we had a new manual that just came out in 2017, and we've made, again, more changes based on research, based on um, uh, clinical findings, because one of the things we had found is that, you know, when you start to apply something, you have to take what you learn from your clients and adapt your therapy, and you take your research findings and adapt it to your clients. So it's changed back and forth, and our therapists and all the trainers that we've had have given us lots of feedback. So um, what looks like that first month or, or second, you see the bones of CPT, but you'll see it's changed over time. And I'll show you some of the new and future research, the stuff that's not out yet. Um, so in the beginning, um, PTSD was conceptualized as an anxiety disorder. If you're out in the hallway, there are seats over here. Over here. <laughs> um, PTSD was conceptualized as an anxiety disorder, and, it, and that was in 1980. I started working in the field before that, and we were just working on this nameless disorder. It was called rape trauma syndrome, or battered women syndrome, or child abuse syndrome, or combat syndrome, or whatever. And then, lo and behold, they figured out we were all talking about the same thing. And so in 1980, um, with a, with a pretty strong push um, so that it wouldn't die again after the Vietnam War, um, as, as often these things do tend to get pushed to the back burner again, um, it, get re it got reified. And then, of course, once you've got something in the DSM, 
whether you like it or not, it's going to get studied. And, and that, that sometimes the impetus for studying something. So it was classified with the anxiety disorders until 2013. Um, I never liked it in the anxiety disorders. I was on the DSM-4 committee and the DSM-5 committee, and we tried to get it out of the anxiety disorders in DSM-4 um, because there was a lot of research that it, there's a lot of people who don't have any fear and anxiety. They have sadness, anger, um, guilt, shame, all sorts of other emotions. Um, and it didn't always fit. Um, and I think calling it an anxiety disorder gave everybody tunnel vision. Um, so we were pushing, and our whole committee had voted to move it out of the anxiety disorders. They went to the anxiety disorders committee, and they agreed with us. And then it went to the big little APA, um, the psychiatry organization. And they didn't know what to do with it, so they left it where it was. So it took until 2013 to get it moved. And then by then, of course, we had seen a lot more research. Um, so we knew that people with PTSD had lots of other emotions other than just fear and anxiety. Shame, guilt, anger, sadness, you name it. Um, they're going to have lots of different negative affects. And in fact, fear and anxiety was not a good predictor of who was going to get PTSD and, and not recover from their trauma. Guilt and anger were much better predictors um, following the trauma. And we think of it as a failure to recover, not that you develop PTSD. People don't get worse. They just don't get better. The worst of time is the, the moment of the trauma. And so some people will start having flashbacks, nightmares immediately. And some recover, takes a few months. Some don't recover. And they stall out. Usually it's about, it looks like it's about a month and when the avoidance really kicks in. Cognitions have been shown to precede change in PTSD in both exposure therapy and cognitive treatments. Um, so we started thinking about it maybe not so much as a bottom-up habituation model, but maybe a top-down um, cognitive model, or maybe it's both. A con could be a combination of both. Maybe there's more than one mechanism of change. What a shocking idea. Um, so even when I was doing cognitive therapy, people kept saying that I must be doing habituation fear response. And so I did a dismantling study just to see if that was the case. So I'll show that in a little while. Um, so this is what DSM-5 now looks like. And those bars there are the, are the actual changes in it. So it's no longer an anxiety disorder. There's a different chapter that has um, PTSD. It has acute stress disorder. Um, they even changed the criteria for um, adjustment disorder to expand it out. So if you're sub-threshold PTSD, you can get a diagnosis of adjustment disorder. And, and there isn't that short time window that used to be. Um, we, t we tightened up the um, what fit under criterion A. So finding out you have a cancer diagnosis is not a criterion A stressor. Uh, people dying of natural causes is, doesn't cause PTSD. It causes lots of other things. Um, but and nothing to say that people aren't going to have disorders, but they're not going to get PTSD from it. So we, we tightened it up that it had to be a, a, an actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation um, to you or a loved one. Um, the intrusion symptoms, uh, what we did there was get rid of the thinking part of it. There were a lot of different measures of PTSD, and some of them say, I think about it. And that's not what we were intending by intrusions. Intrusions are something that come at you when you're trying not to think about it. So if somebody came into treatment and say, oh, I think about it all the time, and somebody gave them yes on that, they were giving them probably a faulty diagnosis. Um, so we got the thinking part out because now that's in a different category. Um, so what we had then was um, we, we have much more of the sensory intrusions that are kind of against your will. You're starting to fall asleep at night and all of a sudden you're remembering it again or you're not feeling well. We see people who retire and suddenly they have too much time on their hands. High functioning people with PTSD are the busiest people on earth. You know, they'll have two jobs, they'll go back to school, they'll do all sorts of things. Um, and, and, and then, you know, when they retire, all of a sudden they've got this time and it's now back. It never went away. They just managed to avoid by busyness. All right. And speaking of avoidance, um, we used to have seven items under avoidance. Now we have two. Um, in, in avoiding internally or avoiding externally. There's some chairs over there, folks. There's a couple down here in the front. Um, um, 
That doesn't mean there are only two kinds of avoidance, internal or external. Internal would be avoiding your thoughts or, in, or, or pushing away and doing something to stop um, the, um, stop the, um, uh, the intrusions or the strong emotions from happening. It might be drinking, it might be cutting, it might be doing all sorts of other behavioral things to stop and, and suppress. Um, but the, the external avoidance would be avoiding anything that reminds you of the trauma. But there's a thousand ways that people can avoid, maybe a thousand thousand. There's probably as many ways as avoid as there are people. So one of the things therapists have to learn is, is like, how are you avoiding, not do you avoid? Um, and that, because that's the absence of behavior, you're not doing something, it's sometimes harder to pick out. But if they're always coming in late for the session, or they don't do their practice assignments, or they miss sessions, they're avoiding. Um, I've had people who tell jokes to get me off topic. That's avoiding. It's like, ooh, <laughs> got me again. So you have to kind of figure out in what ways they're avoiding. And um, so telling me a joke is one way to get me to avoid and right along with them. And you don't want to cl collude with their avoidance because that's what actually keeps the PTSD going. Um, I don't think of it as one of the primary symptoms. I think of it as a secondary bad coping. It works in the short run, but not in the long run. Sometimes being angry is a form of avoidance. And if you can get angry at the therapist and push them away, or get angry at other people and push them away, it's a form of avoidance. All right, so it says two, they have to do two, and you gotta figure out, are they avoiding in some way or in another? So you, you're, the question is, in what ways are you avoiding? And what are the things you don't do now that you used to do? It's always a reasonable question to ask. The new category is negative alterations in cognition and mood, and that came from an abundance. By the way, everything had to have multiple studies. If you were gonna add an item, we had to have multiple studies to support it. The default was to leave something in unless you had multiple studies to get rid of it. So there's a few things that we got rid of or changed the wording on, um, but mostly, I mean, sleep is still in there, and I don't think of that as a PTSD symptom. Um, but anyway, um, Negative uh, uh, alterations in cognition and mood are things like blaming yourself for the trauma, uh, uh, erroneously, falsely blaming someone else instead of the actual perpetrator. Um, it could be um, thinking that the world is a dangerous place now that, and, and now the probability of bad things happening to you has gone up because now it's happened to you. Um, so we have all sorts of cognitions that we look at, and, and we look at cognitions about self, cognitions about others, thoughts about the world. And then we have the full range of emotions that I've already mentioned, and guilt, shame, sadness, and those kinds of things. And sometimes people will really avoid sadness. I'll talk about, I think I'll talk about grief later. Um, people would rather be angry at themselves than actually accept the fact that a friend or a loved one died, and so they'd rather blame themselves and, and be angry at themselves or feel guilty than actually accept it and feel grief. Um, we see that a lot with soldiers who say, I'm afraid I'll forget them if I, if I don't keep my PTSD flashbacks. And that becomes one of the things we would work on. Um, marked alterations. Um, in arousal and reactivity is pretty much the same as it used to be startle response and hypervigilance, but we did add some reactivity, which is not anger as a mood, but aggressive behavior. Our prisons are filled to the brim with people with PTSD. Now, some people, stone cold, don't care they killed, they don't have PTSD. But there's a lot of people who have killed or have acted out because they had PTSD and now they're in prison because they got aggressive with somebody and they assaulted someone or, or something like that. So actually the, the um, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons now requires the therapist to all learn CPT um, and they're using it in federal prisons. Um, uh, and then uh, that's the, those are the criteria. Uh, you, nothing changed. You have to have the symptoms you know, in each of those categories for at least a month. It's got to be clinically distressing or what's the point. You wouldn't call it a disorder if it doesn't distress you or impair your functioning in some way. Um, and it can't be attributed to something else like a traumatic brain injury or uh, from a car accident or substance abuse or some other, um, something like that. There is now also a subtype, which I won't get into, um, that has prominent uh, dissociative aspects, and we've seen that in both epidemiology research, um, 
They've seen it in um, treatment outcome research. We've seen it in some other kinds of studies that we've done. They've seen it in physiological and fMRI studies that there's this small group of people who are very dissociative, and they seem to respond quite differently, both biologically and even in terms of treatment. They're the one group that we do the accounts with because they have a fragmented memory who may need to put it back together. Okay, so cognitive processing therapy, CPT, the therapy I'm going to be talking about today is a short-term evidence-based treatment. Um, it's a very specific protocol. It's going to, if it's done as a set 12 sessions, it'd be session one, do this, session two, do this, session three, do this, and so on. Um, and people always say, isn't that a cognitive behavior therapy? Yeah, it is, with the emphasis on the cognitive. Um, so it may or may not include a written account, and I'll talk about why it's mostly not these days. It's a treatment that can be conducted in groups or individually or in combination. In some of the residential programs, um, in the VA in particular, they do it in a combination. So if they have a, a residential program for substance abuse, they might do individual and group sessions. Or uh, they might do it if they have a PTSD um, intensive outpatient program. They might do a combination of individual and group. So um, it's kind of the best of both worlds if you can do both of those. There's, of course, much more time consuming. So I developed CPT in 1988. That was not my first research. Um, I had already done a treatment outcome study I wasn't too happy with. Um, and instead of, because I was hearing, I was working a lot with rape victims then. You can see from the title of the book, Cognitive Processing Therapy for Rape Victims. Um, they were often telling me things like, no, I didn't think I was going to die. I was just so shamed and humiliated. So I never thought of it as an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. used to get into arguments with people regularly over that. Um, but so I didn't look at the exposure therapies. What I did was I looked over at the cognitive therapies, and I had a choice of Beck or um, Albert Ellis and, at the time. And Albert Ellis had a really rough form of therapy. He was trying to convince people they were thinking wrong. They had thinking stinking and, and all that stuff. And I just didn't think that was going to play in St. Louis. Um, so I went for the more, the softer Beckian version, where he does more Socratic questioning. I think Ellis's therapy softened up quite a bit. But what plays in New York may not play in the Midwest, um, as we might notice from time to time. Um, so I, I did one open trial. Um, I published it in 1992 and did the, did the first manual while I was trying to get a grant funded from NIH, uh, NIMH, and it took me a while. Um, so in the meantime, I got the, I got the, the manual published um, and kept collecting data, and it took me a while before I could um, actually get my first NIH grant funded. To, to do the therapy. Here's what the therapy, the basic therapy looked like. It still does for the most part. Um, you start out with education. Here's why you have PTSD. There's something about it you've been avoiding. Um, there's something about your thoughts that we're going to have to examine and look at because you've been saying something that's gotten you stuck in your PTSD. Anybody here know what a record is? A couple of you? <laughs> the older people in the room. So you have a thought that keeps coming back to you, and back to you, and back to you, and you can't get off of it. You're stuck on that thought. Um, so we talk to them about, there's something about this trauma that you're stuck on, and we've got to figure out what that is so we can get you unstuck so you can get back to normal recovery. So the client's going to learn about the connections between events, thoughts, and feelings. We use an ABC sheet for that. They put in, and, and actually, we have to teach people the difference between a fact and a thought because they think their thoughts are facts. It's my fault. That's fact. No, that's your thought. <laughs> the fact that you were assaulted is the fact. Now, your thought is, it's all my fault. That starts to plant seeds already. Maybe there's another way to look at it. So we're, we name the thoughts as we hear them. Um, so. Sometimes we have to actually help them understand the difference between an event and a thought, and that's gotten very difficult in the last couple of years, as you might have noticed, because um, sometimes there's false facts being thrown out there, and it's hard to tell what's a fact. Um, so we talk about needing evidence for facts. Um, 
and then there's thoughts, and then there's feelings. And then we have, in the old version, we had them write a detailed account of the incident, including sensory details, thoughts, feelings, and so forth. I thought we needed at least an exposure piece in that regard. We only did it for two sessions, but um, we thought, you know, I was assuming we needed some kind of habituation and that we needed somebody, we needed to hear all those details. As it turns out, I was wrong, um, but that sometimes happens. Um, we did processing then. They would read us the account, we would do Socratic questioning, we'd figure out what their worst stuck points were, and then we started to turn the therapy over to them. And one of the goals of CPT is for the client to become their own therapist. So we're trying to teach them. How many of you have had balanced thinking 101 in school? Right, nobody gets it. <laughs> you didn't get it in elementary school, you didn't get it in college, and so we have to normalize it with them and say, nobody gets taught balanced thinking 101. <laughs> so you learn to think the way your parents probably thought or the way people thought around you, like if, if good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, which everybody tends to believe when they're small because we don't tell children if you misbehave, you might or might not get caught and punished, <laughs> you know. So we, we tend to assume that if we behave, things are going to work out, and if we misbehave, things are going to be bad. Now, if something bad happens, we've got a problem here, don't we? Because it's now violated our just world. And so what we do is we have them stop and say, what have you been saying to yourself? Well, it must have been my fault. I must have done something wrong. And that's why I have, you know, but that's why this event happened. If I just figure out what I did wrong, then it won't happen again. Okay, they're trying to keep that sense of control, that sense of just world intact. And so we will challenge questions. There is a, a way that people also go overboard and they'll just say, I don't trust anybody anymore. In other words, instead of going into balance, they go straight from one extreme to another extreme. No one's to be trusted. I can't, um, I, I, I'm never safe. Um, I can't, I have bad judgment, so I'll never make decisions again. You know, they just have all sorts of things. I'm a worthless person. So there's all sorts of things that people will say to themselves that we went from one extreme to the other because of the trauma, as well as trying to distort it to get that just world back. So we have the learning about uh, challenging questions for a single belief. We have them make up a stuck point log of all the thoughts they have, and they might say, that's not a stuck point, that's a fact. That's a, you know, that thought is real, that's true. And I'll say, well, let's put it down there, humor me. Um, and let, let's take a look at that. We will examine that. And if it's true, no problem. If it's not true, we'll find the evidence and figure out what else you can stay, say instead. So they're going to start learning about halfway through the therapy to start doing this therapy for themselves. So they get put one stuck point on a page and they ask themselves a series of questions about it. Then they start looking for patterns of uh, problematic thinking, meaning do you have a tendency to jump to conclusions? Do you have a tendency to mind read? An emotional reasoner is somebody who says, I feel fear, so I must be in danger. I better get out of here. Whew, dodge that bullet. A bad thing was just about to happen and I stopped it. All right, so they've got that tendency to um, jump from their emotions to as proof of their thought. So they now are still convinced that they're in danger because they felt fear. I feel guilty, so I must have done something wrong. Otherwise, why would I feel guilty? <laughs> so they're going backwards from how they feel to, as proof to how they think. So we teach them how to notice what their tendencies are, not just about the trauma, but or traumas, which is most of our clients have multiple traumas, um, to actually thinking about, is that a tendency I have in my general life too? Do I tend to mind read? Do I tend to jump to conclusions? Do I tend to have black and white thinking? You know, that there's only two buckets, trust or not trust, that kind of thing. And then we move them to the final worksheet, which incorporates all the other worksheets, and that is the Challenging Beliefs Worksheet. And the Challenging Beliefs Worksheet has all the other worksheets in it. It's got the ABC sheet in it, it's got the challenging questions, it's got the patterns of problematic thinking, and then the only thing we add after that is, what else could you say to yourself now that you've asked yourself all these questions and looked at your patterns? What's more balanced? What's more factual? And we'll have them look at the evidence against as the place to look for an alternative thought. 
and the, then they'll rate how much do you believe that, now how much do you believe the old thought, now what do you feel, it might be less of the first feeling, now, it, or it might be um, uh, actually um, uh, an entirely different feeling. Before I was blaming myself, now I'm blaming the rapist. Now I'm angry. I used to feel guilty. So it might be a completely different shift in emotion. And we differentiate with our clients the difference between a natural emotion, which we're all hardwired for. If I got you up on the top of the building and pushed on your back, um, I understand it's kind of rickety on some of these buildings up there, you wouldn't have to think, oh, I should be scared now, <laughs> right? You would automatically be scared. And if I jumped back and said, kidding, you'd turn around and what would you feel? Angry? Yeah. You don't have to think about that either. <laughs> Why'd you do that? You know? But if you switched around and said, I should have known not to go up on the roof of that resick woman. She's got beady eyes. Now I'm feeling guilty because I went up on the roof with that woman who wasn't to be trusted. That's a manufactured emotion. All right? So we help differentiate. The natural emotions, we want them just to feel. And the manufactured emotions are the ones we want to change by what they're saying to themselves by looking at the evidence. So that's where we focus a lot of the therapy on is their manufactured emotions. We don't work on their emotions, we work on their thoughts. And if they're natural emotions, then we're just going to say feel them. They're going to go away over time, as you all know from having had emotions. Um, so over accommodation is that jumping to con big conclusions that are way beyond um, real, going from one extreme to the other. And so we've got safety, trust, power and control, esteem, and intimacy. And we'll have a module on each one. I started doing that when I was doing group treatment, but we found it quite helpful. They can be self-referent or other referent, meaning I, uh, self-safety is I don't trust myself. Other safety would be I don't trust uh, other people are dangerous. Or uh, self-safety is I can't, I, I can't protect myself. Self-trust is you know, I don't trust my judgment. Other trust is people aren't to be trusted. Power and control. If I don't control everything, bad things will happen to me. Um, or people are trying to control me. There's self-esteem. There's other esteem. In other words, the regard to which you hold other people. And we'll, you can see how people get group, have prejudices against entire groups of people um, who would remind them of somebody who assaulted them or remind them of, you know, the parent abused them or whoever. Um, and then intimacy is also self-intimacy, and that's beyond self-esteem. That is, who am I? Your sense of self, your sense of worth. Um, and then what are my tastes? What are my values? Being alone without being lonely, being able to say, I don't need everybody's approval. I mean, Maslow would really like me. Um, and then uh, other intimacy, of course, is the full range of, of other um, relationships. And then we, find out, we finalize it with having them write their impact statement again, and then we compare the two from where they started therapy to where they ended therapy. And usually it's, wow, wow, did I really think that? <laughs> Which is always a fun session. So after conducting um, 84 pilot cases, my graduate student and I, um, I finally, after doing the first open trial, um, and back in that day, I was actually able to publish it in Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, which would never be published there today because it didn't have a randomized control group. It was just an open trial. Um, but I was finally uh, awarded a grant in 1994 to compare cognitive processing therapy to prolonged exposure, and I had to change it over to being an individual therapy so I could compare it to prolonged exposure, and that's an exposure therapy that includes um, going over and over again the account of what happened to them. They do that verbally, and then they do behavioral exposures out in the environment. And usually that's after, again, an education session, um, and then usually some breathing kinds of re just to, I think it's just to kill it sometimes so they don't get to the exposures until session three. Um, but anyway, they've had that in there. And then I had a delayed treatment wait list, and then they got either randomized to CPT or PE. Um, so this is how it looked. Um, we started out, uh, if you go down to who was randomized into the study, it was 181 were randomized into the study. 
Um, Ten were terminated because they met the exclusion criteria at some point in the trial. So we had 171 in our intent to treat. For those of you who have not gotten intent to treat, that means everybody we randomized in, we're going to do data analysis on whether you stayed in the study or not. And back then, we didn't have the fancy statistics that we have today, so we used to have to take their pre-score and carry it all the way forward to post. I had one woman who had all 12 sessions and didn't come in for the post-treatment. I knew she got better, but I had to use her pre-treatment score as her post-treatment score. Um, we have much fancier statistics now that we can manage with missing data and looking at session data and all that kind of good stuff. Um, we had a number that never returned for the first session, um, and that's common. They say, I'm, I want to be in your study, and then they go, ooh, I'm feeling better, I'm feeling worse, I think I won't. Um, 86% of these people who were hypothetically rape victims had other traumas in addition to, and that is typical. So I kept saying, can't I do a study with PTSD? And they said, no, you're a rape researcher. So my second study, when I was trying, I was trying to get it in there, um, I finally got them to let me, I did a battered women's study, so then they let me do women, but then, um, they wouldn't let me do men because I hadn't done a study with men yet. It's like, can't we just study PTSD? Does it matter? Um, to NIH at the time, it did. So anyway, you can see 86% had other traumas. 41% had a child sexual abuse history. And on average, they had six other types of adult traumas happen to them. Not numbers, but types of traumas happen to them. So at least one other rape, physical assaults. I was surprised that a quarter, more than a quarter of them had a homicide or alcohol vehicular death of a close friend or family member. So I mean, there was just a, a range of things. And that, that I was just looking at crimes. I was not looking at accidents or natural disasters. So I'm sure the rate was even higher. Um, this is the intent to treat sample. This is in everybody, including all those people I carried over their pretreatment scores. Um, we had about a 26% dropout rate. Um, you can see, if I can find the, my little thing up here, this is the waiting list group, the one that doesn't change here. This is across the six weeks. We, on all of my studies, we always did tw two sessions a week for six weeks. Um, and because we didn't want to leave people on a waiting list too long. So you see they don't change, then they get randomized. And you can see there's really not much difference between CPT and PE. They both dropped in, in the intent to treat sample, they both dropped about 50% in their scores. And um, there was just a very small effect size difference between the two treatments on PTSD. The picture is a little bit different, not between PE and CPT, but the picture is a little bit different when we look at the people who actually completed treatment. Um, we had... Um, a 75% drop in their scores if they completed treatment. There was, again, a small effect size difference favoring CPT, but nothing to get too excited about. Um, and what happened? There we go. That's diagnosis. 80% lost their PTSD diagnosis. Um, now, I was at a university that gave um, part of the indirect money back to the department, who then gave part of the money back to the PI, and so I was able, when this study was done, to do a follow-up. So I started doing a follow-up study um, to look at the long-term effectiveness, um, because most of the studies, had, at most had gone out a year, and I was curious as to how people were still doing. And so I had enough money. We went back and tried to contact all 171. Now we had fancier statistics. So, I went back and tried to get all 171 who were in the intent to treat sample, whether they had therapy or not, and um, had to get a survey research firm to help us, because they were, they were all women, and sometimes women changed their names and moved to other states, strangely enough. Um, so we weren't able to positively locate 27 of them. Um, they didn't contact them or anything. They just helped us try to track them. Um, three had died. We had a large age range. I don't think it had anything to do with their treatment. Um, two of them were not appropriate. We had very few exclusion criteria. If people had had a schizophrenia diagnosis, we let them in as long as they were stable. Bipolar, we let them in. Personality disorders, we let them in. Substance abuse, if they weren't abusing in the last few months, we let them in. Okay. So we had two people that we could tell from the phone screen. One was completely drunk 
and the other one sounded quite manic. Um, so we just decided they probably were not going to give us valid data, so we considered them inappropriate for the follow-up. 11% uh, refused. Out of the 26, 120, uh, out of the 171 we attempted to locate, we did get caps on 126 of those we, lo in fact, located. Um, we, so we located 126. That was 87 percent of the original sample. And, and, to and in total, it was, no, that's of the ones we found. And, and it was uh, 70 percent of the original 171. I was so excited to get that kind of response rate that I almost didn't care what the results were. So here's the results. And, and again, as I said, we, now we have other statistics. So I was looking at, instead of looking at the CAPS, what we looked at was the uh, NFOS PTSD symptom scale because we were giving that every week to people. So they had two sessions a week. We gave it to them once a week. So here's their pre yeah. Excuse me. So we gave it to them at pre-treatment, two weeks, four weeks, or two, session two, four, six, eight, ten. Here's session 12, here's post-treatment, three months, nine months, and five to ten years follow-up, which would be around the room if I did it proportionally. Um, they didn't relapse. That was the exciting news. And both PE and CPT worked on their PTSD. And nice slope and and we did see a number of them did go to get more treatment, um, but they got treatment for other things. My son was diagnosed with ADHD, marital therapy, weight loss programs, you know, other things, not going back to get treated for, for the rape that they came in with as their index event. We did a lot of secondary papers um, comparing PE and CPT. Um, in some cases, there's no difference. There was no difference in depression. In guilt, there was a difference because it's a cognitive therapy. CPT did better on the, co on the guilt cognitions. Um, it did better on the reported health symptoms. They just did reported things like headaches, stomach aches, stuff like that. We weren't doing uh, health diagnoses then. Um, anger was interesting. Uh, they, if they stayed in, they did the same, but they were more likely to drop out of prolonged exposure um, if they were really angry. We had an interaction with age, which you'll see sh shortly when it comes up again. Um, younger clients did better with CPT. Older clients did better with PE. Now, maybe that's they get more rigid in their thinking. It's harder to change their mind. They need those repetitions so that they can remember. I don't know. That may be, uh, there may be something about that because, again, it's going to show up even within my military sample with a smaller age group. Um, hopelessness, they did better with CPT, suicidal ideation. They improved in both cases, but did better with CPT and did the same on social and work functioning. We did a bunch of papers where we collapsed across PE and C the CPT because we wanted to look at two other things. So we wanted to look at how, how they did if they had borderline personality characteristics. And so we looked at them at pre-treatment, whether they had high or low borderline characteristics. And in fact, there was no difference at the outcome on their PTSD, but they started, the people with borderline personality characteristics started higher. They actually had a steeper slope and they ended up in the same spot that the people who didn't have borderline personality. And then later on, you'll see we followed up with them to see how they looked at the five to 10 year follow-up on their borderline personality. That's not yet. Um, Mike Griffin, one of my colleagues, and I were interested in doing psychophysiological assessment. We found that responders had uh, lower startle to loud tones, even though we weren't we're doing a cognitive therapy or exposure therapy, and that has nothing to do with loud tones. Um, but and they didn't get any loud tone exposure in the meantime. All they did was get. Uh, either CPT or PE, but they had less startle response at post-treatment compared to the non-responders. So we compared res people who did better and, and responded to the CPT compared to the non-responders. There was no difference in outcomes ba based on whether they had a child sexual abuse history, which I said was 41 percent, um, or a child physical abuse history. Sometimes there's people out there arguing you got to do a lot of other therapy first. We didn't do a lot of other therapy first. We went right into CPT or PE. Um, change in PTSD symptoms, 
now this is where we get to, we looked at them at the long-term follow-up and change in PTSD symptoms mediates, in other words, it was related to changes in personality severity on paranoid, schizotypal, antisocial, borderline, avoidant, and dependent personalities. I don't like to think in terms of personality disorders. I'd rather uh, start to think like overgeneralized patterns of behavior or overgeneralized patterns of thinking. So if they've been doing a lot of these things, acting in certain ways, that may be just an expansion on their PTSD. And when you treat their PTSD, these other things tend to go away. Um, uh, Cassidy Guttner was curious about, even though they're supposed to come in twice a week for six weeks, she was curious about frequency of sessions because just because you want them to come in doesn't mean they're going to. Sometimes they would just no show on you or cancel or be sick or something. And what she found was frequency, how, how fast they did the therapy made a difference. The faster you do the therapy, the better the outcome. And that was more important than being consistent. Consistently coming once a week, you didn't do as well as if you, if you did faster. So we've got a lot of studies you'll see coming up that we're doing faster and faster CPT. It's get, we're getting down to a week now with it. Um, Change in PT, uh, more free, uh, we, uh, Safran Derek Safransky looked at the dropouts from two studies, this study and another study, and found that just because they dropped out of therapy doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Um, so I, I, I argue with people when they get all bent out of shape about what's the dropout rate. 37% of the dropouts had a good end state. <laughs> And I found the same thing with the military sample. 27% of my military sample lost their PTSD diagnosis. They just don't care we're doing research. You know, they're done. Bye. See ya. Um, so we also looked at practice assignments. This one we've been sending back and forth. And, and it, actually, this one, this one is in press. Doing their practice assignments matter. If they, they do a lousy job or they don't bring them in, it makes a difference. Bringing a, doing a worksheet a day, you see a lot more improvement than if they don't do their practice assignments. We actually, in the clinic, will fire them if they don't do their homework after a few sessions. Come back when you're ready to do the treatment, because the treatment is dependent on you doing your practice assignments. OK, so then I went and moved to the VA. And in the meantime, I'm doing the um, dismantling study, which I'll show you in a minute. I, was, I moved right in the middle of it. Um, Candace Munson did a study with Vietnam, mostly Vietnam vets, 78% were Vietnam vets. They had been in treatment for years and found that 40% of them uh, lost their PTSD diagnosis in those 12 sessions, and the dropout rate was only 20%. Down in Australia, uh, David Forbes replicated it, found the same kinds of findings, and then the VA in the US decided to disseminate CPT. Probably helped that I knew who Tony Zeiss was, and she was now in charge of mental health in the VA, and I kept saying, Tony, I'm in being invited to do these workshops in various places. This seems very unsystematic. And she said, well, it's in our, in our uh, planning that we're gonna start doing rollouts. You wanna start? I said, okay. So she gave me a whole lot of money. Um, and we started uh, the first rollout. I didn't get to do what I wanted to do because then they started all these other rollouts. But anyway, the phase one was it started in 2006. I moved to the VA in 2003. Um, we had to write the, man the treatment manual, so we had to update it, uh, make it appropriate for mili use military and, and veteran examples. Um, we had to come up with a group manual and an individual manual, the materials manuals, all the materials they need. We revised some of those, changed some of the worksheets and so forth. We had to come up with a trainer's manual and a PowerPoint presentation, and I had to put in all the notes, and we all had to put in all the notes that went with, so the trainers would know what to say, because I'm used to just like, as you see, standing here and talking with slides. Um, but I had to put everything down that I would think to say. <laughs> Um, so that took a while, and writing the manuals took a while. We had a consultant's manual because the part of training, the workshop is the beginning of training, and then they had to do six months of um, getting weekly um, case consultation, and then they could be put on a roster if they'd completed at least two cases and had attended the case consultation. Um, and then we did our first train the trainer conference, and I didn't have enough people in the VA who now got to do CPT, so I recruited some of my um, 
cronies from St. Louis that I had trained and had been part of my research. And so we had a few non-VA trainers to begin with. Um, so from 2007 to 2012, we had 66 funded workshops. Um, we had 62 where the VAs asked us to come back and do another workshop that wasn't part of the rollout. Um, so we did a whole lot of workshops. Um, did them for the VA, the vet centers, uh, the Department of Defense asked us to come out and do them in military bases. We did refresher workshops for people who came to the first workshop and then didn't attend the case consultation. And then they said, can I do it now? And so we had a refresher workshop. We didn't let them just start case consultation. They had to go through a, like, why didn't you pick it up to begin with? So they had to confess. And then they had to do the whole workshop again. Um, anyway, so we had, we had those available. And then we had more train the trainer workshops because we needed more trainers. At this point, we now have 100 trainers. Um, inside and outside the VA. Um, consultation phone calls were available 48 hours a week, so no excuses. There's time, you, we can find a time where you can fit into a group, and the groups usually had about eight people in them, and you'd talk about your cases, and you'd hear about other people's cases. Um, we did a lot of top-down work, getting the support of people at various levels of the VA. Vision means region, basically. So we had people who, um, that we um, had them uh, make sure that we were getting the, the support of the mental health um, community who were the supervisors, because you can't just count on the, the therapist saying, I want to do this. Their supervisor has to give them the, the workload release to be able to be on those phone calls, to go to the workshops, and so forth. So we had to, ha we had to work uh, at every level of VA to get this thing rolling. And I wanted to bring everybody back for a second workshop, and they said, no, we're starting the PE rollout. You can't bring everybody back for a second workshop. So we started doing advanced lectures. The nice thing about being in the VA is you can take over everybody's computer. And you can, you can they, they turn on their computer and plug in, and you are advancing the slides. You can mute everyone and go through your lecture and then leave time for questions. We recorded every one of those lectures. I don't know how many lectures there are, 50 or 60 of them, advanced lectures on various topics. And then we recorded them and then posted them. And they could get CE credits for attending. Um, but we were able to give them a lot of advanced work through the teleconferences, and then we would open up the lines for questions, or they could put questions in the little chat box and so forth. Um, we start in the beginning. Sometimes there would be 30 or 40 people. I think in the end there were, you know, sometimes two or 300 people on the line at once. You know, um, obviously that's why you have to mute; otherwise, you're hearing a lot of stuff in the background. Um, then we had to decentralize because you know VA central office is not going to pay for this forever. So they said, OK, you need to train the local trainers in each of these 22 regions, these visions, and they're going to have to start paying for it. So they're going to have to take over if they want CPT done, and we are mandating it. And your boss gets his bonus based on whether you're doing CPT. So there was a carrot and stick involved in there. Um, <laughs> And sometimes people would get bonuses for doing CPT, or they would get a lighter workload. I mean, there was all sorts of things that they were doing if they did one of the evidence-based treatments. Um, we came up with computerized session note templates to make it easy to do the dropout. Which, which thing are you doing? Are you doing group? Are you doing CPT with or without the accounts? What are you doing here? And then, and there was even things like, if you didn't do X component of this session, why didn't you do it? And when are you going to do it? Um, we did program evaluation, and then we've done a couple since then, or at least they have. I've left. <laughs> um, so the national rollout from 2007 to 2015, um, that's when we were mostly, there's, you can see there's an overlap because we started the regional ones in 2010, and those are still going on. Um, and that's where the, the funding tended to shift. Um, but we tried to get one to seven trainers per region, per vision, and we had coordinators and so forth and so forth, and all together. This is people who are currently in the VA. Now, that's, there's been a lot of people who have left the VA that are now in the community, and some of them are on our, our civilian roster, because we have a CPT website where people can get rostered in mental health centers and so forth. Um, but currently, there are uh, 4,700 people who are on the CPT provider roster. 
which is really nice when somebody says I'm moving to California and you want to know who to refer them to, you know, who's, who's on the roster and who's been trained to do CPT, especially if they leave in the middle or whatever. We can do the same thing. I don't have to answer all those questions about, do you know somebody in Philadelphia who can do CPT? We can just go into the roster and look. And the, the, the answer to the question about Vermont, zero, if you're wondering. Um, you have no rostered clinicians outside the VA in Vermont. Um, this is how uh, the number of workshops look. We, you know, we started out doing all the nationally funded ones, and then you can see how the regional ones took over. And here's the results. Um, these are brand new clinicians uh, that we're training, so we're monitoring, and I don't think you need to know whether they're Vietnam or OEF, OIF, or Persian Gulf, or something else, but you can see the scores were coming down. That's the old PCL, and then when they switched the, to the um, CP, when they changed to the DSM-5, it was different scoring, but you can see same kind of slope. Um, when they're giving us the, the weekly measures on them, sometimes there's a little blip when they're going through some of the tough part of the, about the trauma itself, the, the, the Socratic questioning and stuff, and then as you move on to, with the protocol, the scores drop quite dramatically. Um, so they were doing quite well. Then there was a uh, Candace moved from the VA and went up to from Boston in Boston, where she was had been my uh, deputy director, and moved up to Ryerson University in Toronto. The VA in Canada uh, wanted to; um, they were interested in dissemination, but they, unlike the VA, who wouldn't let us do research. Um, in the US, they only would let her do a dissemination project if she did a research project, which I thought was just fascinating. Um, so they compared different kinds of therapist consultation to determine the best way to train and help them implement and adopt CPT. So they had a no consultation group, although you know they knew what they were watching their scores, so I, I wouldn't say that they're probably um, uh, the same as somebody who's really let loose on the, on the community. Um, they got regular phone calls like the ones I just described, and with eight, many of eight people on the call, they're talking about. And then they had a tech ad, uh, enhance where they'd listen to session, sections of the sessions um, and to see if that really helped, if they can listen to part of the session, does that help your consultation? Uh, do they do better therapy? And the answer was no. Um, strangely enough, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the no consultation group, I think probably did better when they looked at their outcomes. They were turning in the scores. They probably were more attentive because they were, um, because they knew they were being monitored even though they weren't getting consultation. I, I don't think they would have done that well. But the one that was a surprise was the tech enhanced didn't do much better than the no consultation at all. And I think it was because it would take up too much of the time to, of the consultation to, or, you know, they get a breakdown and couldn't get find the place in the clip, or it wasn't a good clip, or you know, it, it just like burdened them. They they did a much better job with when they just did the standard consultation. So that's what we've been encouraging: is don't try to get it fancy. Just just do your consultation. Okay. So we changed the name. Um, I mentioned I was doing a dismantling study. Um, part of the reason, I, well. Not, Maybe more than part of the reason. People kept saying it's habituation, it's habituation. You're having them write their accounts. That's the mechanism of change. And I said, okay, let's figure that out. If I just do cognitive therapy without the, the written accounts, do, will it be as good? Now, I put the written accounts in, so my hypothesis was that you needed the written accounts. And so what we did is we came up with three groups um, to compare. Um, we had 150 participants. This time they let me actually put in other kinds of traumas. Um, you can see over there on the left is their index events on this far left column. 31% said an adult sexual assault was their worst trauma, their index event that they're going to start therapy with. Uh, child sexual assault, 38%. Adult physical assault. Very rarely did you see a childhood physical assault be their index event. Um, but you, if you look at that middle column, it, that's all in the 70s and 80s. They had that in their histories anyway. A lot of them had big time trauma histories. In fact, they came in with higher average um, uh, PTSD scores than the first time. It's like there was enough people in the community in St. Louis that, I'll send you that one. <laughs> you know? And so they were referring to some of their worst cases. Um, five minutes, oh boy. Um, chronicity was about 14 years later. They had other stuff. Um, 
on average, usually you see about 50 percent have major depressive disorder. Um, so we had three conditions. We had the old uh, version of CPT with the written accounts. We had a version without where they'd spend more time doing the ABC sheets. And then we broke up one session and turned it into two. And then we had a written account thing, which is kind of artificial because we only had two sessions of written accounts. So we made it look like PE, where they would have seven sessions. Uh, they had two weekly sessions, and then they had an, uh, we'd put them in a room to write for an hour, and then they would read it back to the therapist and process it, but they couldn't do any cognitive therapy. And the surprise to me was that the cognitive-only group had a clinically significant drop here. There, were, there was an overall group difference between the written account group and the cognitive therapy group. Um, but this is a clinically significant drop between sessions two and four, and it wasn't until they got in CPT, it wasn't until they got done writing the accounts that they had their clinically significant drop. And they had a 15% higher dropout rate. And in the end, they caught up, but there was no value added from having written in the accounts. So if they're more likely to drop out and there's nothing, no value added, why do it? So every study I've done since then that I've had control over has been without the accounts. Um, Kate Chart also looked in the, uh, in the VA uh, and looked at people who had one or the other versions and found out there was no difference between um, CPT and getting CPT with the accounts. She let them choose which they wanted to do. Um, so we changed the names. We had been calling it CPTC and somebody in a workshop rightly said, Cognitive processing therapy, cognitive? That doesn't make any sense. So we said, okay, let's make it CPT plus accounts. And now we're calling CPT the version without the accounts. Um, in the meantime, as soon as we finished that variable length study, uh, my colleague who helped finish up the study in St. Louis came to me and said, I really think, well, even before that, because she had to submit the grant application, she said, if I just had a couple more sessions, I think I could have gotten them around the corner. So she redefined what a treatment completer was and said, okay, a treatment completer is somebody who gets a low score who has a good end state, not somebody who has just 12 sessions, you know, raise that go. Um, so they could stop early if they had a low score. And this was using, again, the, the updated PDS. This is a, another PTSD self-report measure. The BDI had to be below a 10. They could go up to 18 sessions because, again, this was a research project. You couldn't go on endlessly. Um, but if they needed more time, they just didn't do the final impact statement. They just kept doing more of the worksheets and using the stuck points uh, logs. Um, and what she found was that of these civilians, and these were men and women, hey, they finally let us study men. Um, so um, she found that 58% were early responders. And they, uh, uh, I think they averaged about seven or eight sessions. So I made up 12. It sounded like a good number at the time. I'm wrong. <laughs> you know? uh, and I really love the idea of doing, treating people until they're better as opposed to saying, you've only got 12 sessions. Um, there was a group that needed more. 26% uh, needed more therapy. Um, until they got to a good end state, there were, one, there were like one or two people who stopped right at 12, and there were one or two people who were non-responders. Um, this is how it looks compared to my first two studies. You can see that the, this is positive diagnostic status on the cap. So on my first study comparing P, that's just the CPT part of it. The blue bars, post-treatment and follow-up, you can see 80% more than 80% lost their PTSD diagnosis. Um, and then uh, didn't do quite as well, but we're still below 30%. Uh, so 70% uh, lost their PTSD diagnosis. But hers are the green bars. She, at the three-month follow-up, she only had one person with PTSD out of the 50 she treated. So that won me over, and I've been doing a study um, where we're looking up to 24 sessions with active military. They're tougher to treat. Uh, we can talk about that in the reception if anybody's interested. Um, length of time for treatment, I went, let them go up to 24. We didn't have anybody who got better and passed like 20 anyway. Um, so we were trying to look and see how they looked. Um, they had anywhere from four to 23 sessions. And oh, I said 20, uh, 20 they, I think one person did got, get better and, and hit a low PCL5 um, by 
session 23. Um, we had one person who's a dropout that we're going to move. He, le he just left and he had a score of five at his last assessment, but he didn't tell us he was dropping, you know, that he wasn't coming back. But we're putting him in and we'll, we're going to move him up to the completers. These are just first look of the data. Um, there, were ch there were 20 people who had all 24 sessions. Um, we had to stop them at 18 weeks. I'm going to put those two together because it's like 24 sessions or 18 weeks, whichever comes first, because we were trying to treat them twice a week. Um, sometimes the military pulled them out um, and sent them to a training, sent them to another uh, base, sent them somewhere else, deployed them, whatever. Um, and uh, boop, 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 boop. here we go. Um, Here's the number who were remitted at one month follow-up. And, and I'm sorry I gave a one month follow-up because I wanted to do a full diagnosis. We lost a lot of people, particularly the military people because they were off and gone. But of those we could get in, um, you can see 45% who were discontinued by the Army and there were only five of them didn't have, uh, had lost their PTSD diagnosis. 27% um, who ran out of time. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 27% of the dropouts lost their PTSD diagnosis, I already mentioned that. Um, and then, but you can see the people who actually got to the low end state, most of them had remitted. Uh, and then we got the new book, um, and we, that just came out in 2017. I'm going to do this really fast. Um, eh, read the book. Um, <laughs> um, We've got lots of research findings with active military. That's who I've mostly been working with. I've been doing DOD grants, um, working with the Strong Star Consortium and the consortium to alleviate PTSD. Um, we had, in my first study, we did group treatment, uh, comparing, comparing group PC, CPT with group PCT. We got, we got some interesting um, biological findings on fMRI that I don't have time to talk about and, and aren't on the slide. Um, doing um, doing uh, PCT, present center therapy, has been shown to be an effective treatment, and that means just focusing on current um, PTSD symptoms, current problems, and so forth. Um, but fortunately, the, uh, the CPT did better, not as much as I wanted. I wanted a larger effect size than a 0.4. I was hoping for more of a medium effect size the way it was powered. Um, then I did a second study, a study I'd wanted to do for decades, which was to compare individual and group treatment, and that definitely, uh, we had a better than, uh, better, bigger effect size. Individual did better than group. But the interesting thing is that um, there's reasons for that. 70% uh, of these people have traumatic brain injury. So m what we found so far is that they don't do as well in individual um, this, this is just showing the effect sizes on individual versus group from pre to post. Um, eh, skip that one. Here's what shows up is age. The, I, I remember I mentioned age before. The youngest people, 75% of them lost their diagnosis, especially if they got individual therapy. Once they got to a certain age, it didn't matter whether they got to individual or group. Um, so that's one of the things we're going to want to look at in my... In my uh, in my uh, variable length study is if age makes a difference, I'm interested in looking at cognitive flexibility and if people get less flexible over time. Um, ongoing post-concussive symptoms do better uh, if they get individual than group treatment. Um, we've looked at traumatic loss. That just got accepted for publication. Um, it's mediated by depression. If we don't treat their depression successfully, they're not going to do as well. Um, this next study, we're going to use a grief measure and look at that and, and see how that looks. Um, social, there were perceptions of social support change. I don't know if it's that they actually change or it's a result of decreases in their PTSD. And they look at people in their life differently. Um, and I hear there's going to be some study of that here. Hazardous drinking can be decreased by treatment of PTSD. Um, they didn't drop out at a bigger rate. Their PTSD scores were not higher, and they did just as well with treatment. We don't rule out people with hazardous drinking anymore. And their, their hazardous drinking dropped, but they were not down to the level of being non-hazardous drinkers, so they still need more work on their substance abuse, either within the CPT or outside of it. But they did well. 
Uh, it's been translated into 12 languages. <laughs> uh, this is the latest version of that new book. Uh, it just came out in Japan. Um, it says in English there, the cognitive processing therapy. Um, there have been studies published from research in the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of my favorite studies of all time. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it was so amazing that they did it during a war with people with no paper, no literacy, and they did CBT anyway. They just did it verbally. Um, and the therapist had a junior high school education. So the person who was the PI of the study said to the New York Times, if you can do this there, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> so it's been done in Australia, Canada, Iraq, Cambodia, and Germany, and those are published articles. And there's four uh, CBT papers or uh, studies going on currently in Japan. I mentioned we're going to shorter versions of CPT. We're combining with that. One person is combining it with outdoor activities, particularly for people who are like special services and they don't want the military to know they're getting treated. So they go up to Utah and they take their families on vacation and they get CPT sessions in the morning and then take their family hiking or skiing in the afternoons. Um, and it's all stealth. Um, there's a five-day intensive outpatient that's just started um, compared to regular outpatient. There's Kate Chart is testing a seven-session version. Uh, in my lab, my uh, postdoc, Stephanie, is looking at a modular version of PTSD. And we're also looking, we've also just finished a pilot with a text, it is a texting study, the therapists and the, uh, the clients are texting back and forth. Um, and doing CPT that way. Um, we're looking at all sorts of different comorbidities, insomnia, eating disorders, smoking, borderline personality disorder. That one's out and it's going to be published soon. Um, that one's finished. That was a big multi-site study in Germany and looking at effects of headaches. And we're also looking at the effects of CPT on cardiac functioning in, uh, in, uh, at Duke. And the big study that's going to be coming out, we're going to see the results, the, the first results in August in a meeting. Um, 916 patients treated at 17 sites in the VA. I mean, we're going to do a lot of predictor stuff with that study. And that's the end, and I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> We could take a couple of questions or we could just move out and go into the reception area and if you want to ask questions, you could do it there. We'll take a few questions. Okay. We have a microphone that we're supposed to use. Save some food for us, those of you who are leaving. <laughs> want to ask a question here? Okay. Right here. Um, is there any research um, on CPT or similar techniques being used for youth or Yep. Particularly children? Not children, adolescents. Um, in fact, it's just been accepted by the JAMA Psychiatry. I just got an email and, and got the, the, the copy of it. Um, yeah, it works very well with adolescents. And we've, do, we've done it with a learning collaborative, and they, did, they had a lower dropout rate than the adults, but they had to be 14 or older. I've seen in clinical practice people do it down to age 12. So I think an interesting question is going to be TFCBT versus CPT for adolescents. When, where's the cut line? When does, when does T, TFCBT start seeming too young for them? And when are they old enough to do? But we do have modified worksheets that could be used. We've got ones with pictures on them. We have simplified worksheets. So I think it'd be possible to use it with younger than we have. Yes? Hi. I was wondering if you think there's going to be more of a dropout rate in the texting study just because of the like written assessment part of it. Um, right, the, the pilot that we did, they, we only used the PCL, and so they, had, they did that online because this was just a simple pilot. We had almost no funding for it. Um, I think there's going to be a bimodal distribution. Either they're going to take it and run with it, and they're running faster than the therapist would run with it. They're just zooming through the therapy and doing great or they quit almost immediately. I think that's the way it's going to, we've got a DOD grant in now to look at it as a, as a, because I think that would be a nice thing for the DOD when they can't reach out. We've got the, the, the patient manual, more like a manual now than just a set of materials. So they've got stuff to read. They can look at stuff online. Um, but the, the problem, of course, you've got with any kind of telehealth, we've done three telehealth studies um, that I didn't mention. Um, the, the problem with anything to do with telehealth or, or texting is that you, right now you have to be in the same state that you're licensed in as your client. And, and I think eventually they may move to having a more universal licensure, but we're not there yet. 
We've got a lot of CBOX, the community-based out outpatient yeah. clinics. You say in Vermont, and you say there's no therapist. There, I said there's no. I didn't say there's no therapist. I said there's no therapist in the civilian. Um, we have, we have nobody. We have people who definitely. We have people who are who are listed on the roster. Yeah, in the CBOX and in VAs in both Vermont and, and New Hampshire. Um, but those are VA. Those are for veterans. What we need is more people who are civilian. I mean, there's some states that have really gone gangbusters on, on getting civilians trained because of the, the mental health system in that state. Texas has a ton. Oklahoma has a ton. We've done several in North Carolina. If you look at our roster, you can just see there's certain states that just have a ton of people who are rostered. There's other states you can't find the state. And Vermont was one of those when I went into our civilian. That's that uh, cptforptsd.com. That's where we, have our, we keep our civilian roster. And I, it's, they don't even list Vermont. So need to get more people <laughs> doing it and getting rostered. Yes? Curious how psychiatric medication affects opioid perception. Um, we typically, on, mo on most of our studies, we, we didn't uh, we didn't look at it, frankly. We left it, they had to be either stably on or stably off of their medication. So we asked them, just don't make any changes in it. So um, we've never parsed it out because we didn't have good enough reliable reporting on, because even if you go into their records and see what they were prescribed, that doesn't mean they're taking it as prescribed. Um, so sometimes people will get uh, prescribed a, a depression medication and they'll take it like, whenever they feel like it, um, <laughs> as opposed to like taking it every day at a certain time and, and so forth. So we have not been able to do that. There has been a study with PE versus sertraline um, and it worked for some people and worked for other people, but the problem is medications don't, don't fix the problem and the idea of doing one of these therapies is that you not only get rid of their PTSD permanently, you're teaching them a set of skills that they can carry for life. And we've had people email back their therapists and say, I had another trauma happen and I handled it totally differently. So I like a therapy where that would put us out of business. <laughs> Haven't gotten there yet. So I'm going to say that we should all thank you again. Thank you.